Um, a little bit uh, about myself. My name is David. Um, I've spent, uh, I think, most of uh, my professional career uh, as a developer. And in the past uh, six months or so, I started getting into machine learning and things like that. Um, I watched uh, an online course about uh, convolutional neural networks uh, in around October, a uh, really good one from Stanford. And at the same time, a company called Nexar started a challenge about recognizing traffic lights uh, with convnets. And I decided to participate in that and uh, see if anything of the stuff I learned actually works in, uh, on a real problem. Um, and it worked, I got first place and I'll uh, walk you through my process. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Uh, I'll walk you through my process. Uh, I won't go into theory of neural networks and convolutional neural networks too much. Uh, it will be mostly uh, what things can we do to improve them and get them better and in a challenge scope and a competition scope you actually want those little improvements which is kind of different from uh, maybe a company use case where you m want it to be more robust or maintainable and things like that. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so a little bit about the competition task. So um, the task was given an image taken from a, a mobile device in a car uh, that kind of works like a dash cam, just records what the driver sees. Uh, you need to output one of three labels, whether uh, there is a red traffic light, there is a green traffic light, or there is no traffic light. Okay, uh, you get 18,659 labeled images, and you need to train a model on it, and then you get a test set with 500,000 images. You label them as best you can, um, and you are required to use convolutional neural networks. Um, so just a show of hands, who roughly knows what a convolutional neural network does? Okay, so I'd say that about a third. So I won't go deep into this, but I'll describe in general. So how many of you have heard about the hype of deep learning recently? Okay, everyone, great. So. Convolutional neural networks are part of that hype. Specifically, it works really well for uh, image problems. Um, screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed it, great. Um, and they are really good at classifying images without uh, needing a person to intervene and direct, for example, with traffic lights, it means that theoretically I wouldn't need to like, tell my model anything about the fact that I'm looking for green traffic lights or red traffic lights and things like that. So it's kind of magic. Uh, let's see what we can do with it. Okay, so here's an example of how these images look like, um, just so you can get a sense of the data. So on the top left is an example of a red, on the bottom, you see a green traffic light, and on the top right, there's no traffic light in the scene. Agree? Cool. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about what the score was. So the score is important because uh, who get, whoever gets the best score wins the challenge. Um, so in this case, they define the score as a combination of two metrics. Um, the accuracy of the model and the size of the model. Why is the size even important? Uh, the context here is that they wanna run it on a mobile device uh, in real time, and having a huge model of hundreds of megabytes is just not practical to run on a mobile device. Um, so the challenge accuracy was defined at, out of the 500,000 images, uh, how many did you correctly classify versus uh, out of the total, okay? so if you did uh, 400,000, that would be uh, 0 0.8 for the classification accuracy. The score for the model size is a little bit uh, more fancy. You don't have to actually compute this. The graph looks kind of like this. What you can see here um, is that small model sizes get one, and as the model sizes gets bigger, 
your score gets lower. And it's also important to notice that it gets lower pretty fast. So at around 50 megabytes, you're already at about like 0 0.6. At 100 megabytes, you're at 0 0.4. And after that, you're like decreasing very, very fast. So the model size in this challenge was very important. Um, OK, so another requirement they gave in the challenge is that whatever model you submit, it needs to get at least 95% accuracy. That's pretty high bar. So, But I thought, OK, if that's the minimum requirement, that means probably it's pretty easy. And everyone will get to that. And I'll just focus on the model size. Um, we'll see that I mostly focused on getting to 95 and less on the model size, but OK. Um, so what I used. So this is my first time uh, trying to use deep learning on a real problem or a challenge or a toy problem. And I didn't actually know what uh, framework I should use. I chose CAFE uh, mostly because of the rich model zoo. A model zoo is basically a bunch of pre-trained models on very large data sets um, that can benefit you because you can just take them, continue your training from that point, and that allows you to get pretty good results with not, not too much data and also very fast. Um, PyCafe is just the uh, Python binding for CAFE, uh, so that was pretty useful. I ran everything on Amazon Cloud. Um, the, re the reason is that uh, this laptop uh, doesn't have a fancy GPU, and all these things have to run on GPUs to, if you want them to finish in like a normal time frame. Um, so I rented uh, GPU instances in Amazon. And those are pretty expensive. The basic one costs about 70 cents an hour, which means if you keep it on for a month, that's about $500. The challenge was uh, two months long. So you know, it's from your own pocket. It's kind of. You know, OK, so uh, Amazon has something called uh, spot instances, uh, which allow you to basically bid on leftover resources. And most of the time, you can get the same instance for a much lower price, with the risk that they might just shut down your instance if someone outbids you. Um, so it's not really good for production. But if you can uh, take that risk, it's a good money saver. Um, yeah, what's that? Why not, P2? Why not a P2 instance? Well, I think at that time P2 was just coming out, and I used a ready AMI on Amazon that was kind of meant to work with a G2. So I was like, okay, I'll just try that. At some point, I tried using the P2 instance. I didn't see any improvement in runtime, so I was like, okay, never mind for now. Now, actually, with the stuff I'm doing, I'm using the P2 instances. So. Um, OK, a little bit about my final result, and then we'll go uh, about how I got to that. So the accuracy I got to was 94.955. Um, and uh, the organizers of the competition were kind enough to round that up to 95. <laughs> so you can imagine how much I was sweating to get there, but I just couldn't get it uh, higher than that accuracy. And the model size that I got to was uh, 7.84 megabytes. Uh, to compare, uh, so in the recent competitions in the past years of ImageNet, which is kind of like the baseline for classification of images, um, the models uh, VGG and GoogleNet, you can see the sizes of the models here. So basically, uh, these are too big to be practical in this specific context and this challenge. Um, OK. So let's go through things that worked and how I got the accuracy higher bit by bit. And then we'll also go over some things that didn't work, which was most of what I did. So we'll get to that after. Um, so I started with a baseline. The baseline was actually also on the competition page. that They said that simple, straightforward, fine-tuning of GoogleNet should get you to about 93% accuracy. Um, so First of all, what does that sentence even mean? It means if you take the model uh, called GoogleNet that was trained on a big data set of a million images, uh, take that data set and 
basically what you do is you leave the weights as is, you change the last layer of that network to instead of classifying a thousand images to, uh, to class a thousand classes to classify three classes, and you train from that point on, you should get to about 93%. I did that, I got to a little bit above 90%, so not sure how straightforward what they, what they did was, but that was a good, a good baseline for me. And anyway, I didn't focus on that too much because I knew that I wanted my model size to be uh, smaller and I was sure I'll get to 95 uh, uh, like anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so what I did next is um, just started Googling small neural networks, convolutional neural networks, compact, efficient, etc. And I came across uh, a paper called SqueezeNet. It was uh, published in February 2006, so pretty relevant. And the authors of the papers uh, basically focused a lot of time and energy to get the most efficient network they could in terms of minimal amount of computation and weights and still get very good results. Um, the title of the paper says uh, the model size is under than half a megabyte, and uh, when I actually used it, it was 2.7 megabyte. The reason for that is that they did some post-training tricks to get the model size even smaller, mostly by uh, changing the weights to be not 32 bits, but get them down to like 16 bits and even eight bits and all kinds of smart ways to still keep the, uh, to be able to extrapolate that back to the original weights. But they didn't publish the code for that, so I, couldn't use it as is. Um, so I took that model. Um, it was open sourced uh, in CAFE and also they published uh, the weights after training it on ImageNet. So I took those weights, I fine tuned it on the images from the challenge and after playing a bit with the learning rate to make it actually start decreasing the loss function, I got to 92% accuracy. So. Pretty good, I got to 92% accuracy and model size of 2.7 megabytes. Um, any questions so far? Yes. When you did the fine tuning, did you update all the weights of the network or only six layers? Okay, so the question was uh, when I did the fine tuning, whether I updated the weights of the entire network or just the last layer. Um, so what I did was update the weights of the entire network, but uh, I lowered the learning rate for all the layers until the last one to be like uh, 10 times less than the learning rate of the last layer. So they were updated just that. Yes, the reason I did that is because that was what was easier to do in CAFE, not because I thought it's better in any way, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, so next, uh, 92 is nice, but I need to get to 95%. Uh, if you look at it from the uh, number of mistakes, it's uh, still a pretty big gap. I need to get from 8% error to 5% error. Um, so I started looking at the mistakes the model did. Um, and what I noticed is that some of the images were actually uh, vertical and not horizontal. And they were also flipped in all kinds of weird ways. So you can see the images here are not only vertical, but sometimes flipped to the right, sometimes to the left, sometimes the sky is still pointing up. So it's kind of mixed. Um, only 2.4% of the images in the data set look like this. But I did notice that out of that population, my accuracy was lower if I compare it to regular images. So I thought, okay, it's doing worse on these kind of images. How can I make it better? So my first thought was, I'll correct the images. I'll flip them back, right? Um, so I thought, okay, what would be the easiest way to do that? The images were JPEG. I thought maybe there's some metadata in the JPEG images that tells you know, which way is the sky. Um, I looked, there was no metadata, so too bad. And then I thought, um, maybe if I can write an algorithm to do it in a smart way, find which way is up and do that. I thought about it a little bit. I thought, okay, it's definitely possible, but, uh, I want to look for something easier and that will take me less time. And what I thought about doing is trying to make my model uh, invariant 
to rotations. So basically make my model work with whatever orientation the image is at. Um, so the first thing I did for that is when I trained the model, every time I take an image from the training set, I randomly rotate it by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270, or nothing. And the intuition is by, sh by making my data set actually have images of all orientations equally, the model will learn to classify the traffic lights on, on all the types of images. So I tried to do that. My accuracy actually stayed the same. Um, and then I did something that did improve it, which is after I took that model that I trained on different orientations, and for every image, I ran it through the model four times, each time I rotated by 90 degrees and averaged the result. After I did that, I got an improvement from 92% to 92.6%. Okay, so small but significant improvement. And a big plus side is that it doesn't make my model size any bigger. It just makes the time to uh, give an output slower. But I'm not penalized for that in the challenge score, so I don't care. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, first I tried to train it uh, by passing images in all rotations, but it didn't work unless I, during uh, inference time, averaged out the four orientations for every image. Okay, cool. So um, implementing this, so CAFE, I don't know if you had experience with it, but it's not the most Python-friendly framework, uh, but they do have a concept of Python layers, so you can insert uh, layer in Python instead of C++ uh, in the middle. So the network definitions files are uh, prototext files, which kind of look like this. And you just insert a layer, and the important part is the model and the layer, which mean uh, the model, you should look for a file named rotationlayer.py, and it has a class rotation layer. And then you implement that, so there's a lot of boilerplate, which is not really important. And the only important part is the part in bold at the bottom, which is you take your image, you apply rotate 90 degrees with a random number from 0 to 3. OK? From 0 to 3, yeah. Um, so that was pretty easy to implement and got the results done. So it's nice that they have this Python layer and you didn't have to go to C++ to add it. Um, the next thing I, I, uh, I, I did was oversampling crops. What does that mean? So I noticed that in the implementation I had of SqueezeNet that for every image, it doesn't just run it through the network. It takes a crop of the image, slightly smaller than my image size, in a uh, random location and runs that. The reason it does that is, again, to make my data set artificially larger by taking every image and just taking random locations from it. So that happens by default. But then at inference time, what I did was for every image, I took five crops of the image, um, four for each corner and one in the center, and averaged those results. OK, that got me to an improvement from 92 to 92.4, OK, without the rotations. Was this part clear or any questions about it? Sorry. If the traffic light is not in one of the crops, I will miss it, but that's the reason I'm averaging it. So if the traffic light is in most of the crops, it should be fine. OK? Good? Yeah. No, what I'm averaging is the output of the network is basically not a class. The output of the network is values from 0 to 1 for each class, right? Which is kind of the probability that it's this class. It's like an ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Can you try uh, The question was, did I try not doing averaging of the results, but other, like, ways to, um, uh, I didn't try. No. Um, OK. So the graph you're seeing here is basically what you look at most of the time when you're training a model. That's the 
uh, graph of your loss function. Uh, low is good. You want it to be as low as possible. And you can see that at a, after about 40,000 uh, rounds of training, uh, the loss on the validation data starts going up. It basically means uh, your network is not learning uh, anything that helps generalize with data it hasn't seen. Um, so the first thing I did was, OK, I'll take whatever the network learned at that point. So that's called, uh, uh, so that's a common way to just make sure your network doesn't learn things that are not relevant. But a small trick I added here was after taking the weights at the point where the validation was the lowest, I trained it a little bit more with a much lower learning rate. The intuition is that will allow me to kind of push the weights a tiny bit more to the optimal local minima it's currently at and get some boost. And that got me sometimes no improvement and sometimes up to half a percent. So not bad. Um, next thing I did was, so from the previous graph, what you saw was that basically my network starts uh, overfitting at some point. So the best way to fight overfitting is getting more data. Um, so at the beginning, I took my data set, which as I said, was about 19,000 images. And I split it to a training set, a validation set, there's a test set, uh, because that's what I learned you should do. Um, but then I got greedy and I decided that the 500,000 images of the challenge test set will be fine as my test set and use more of the data for my training, okay? So I changed the split instead of being like, uh, 60, 20, 20 to 80, 20. Um, so after adding that data to the training set and doing the rotations and doing the extra learning with the tiny learning rate, uh, I got to 93.5% accuracy. Okay, not bad, but at this point I was like, okay, I'm still far from 95, I like a little far and I'm out of ideas, so what am I gonna do? So I went back to looking at the mistakes of the model. Um, I plotted this graph, which basically shows out of all the images my model got wrong, how certain was it about its prediction? So the model outputs not a discrete value, but uh, ranges from zero to one. And this shows that value for the maximum value the model had. The weird thing about this graph was the rightmost column, which is why are there like a bunch of images it's really certain about, but still got wrong. So I started looking at those images and surprise, most of them the model actually got right and the ground truth was wrong. Okay, so then I thought, well, I'll fix the ground truth. So I uh, labeled all those images actually all the mistakes, I took about 700 and something images, I labeled them manually. Uh, that changed the label for about 300 of them. Um, not necessarily that my answer was right and the previous was wrong. Some images were just so hard to tell what traffic light there is there that it's really like ambiguous, okay? Uh, but some were pretty obvious. After my correction, um, the plot looked like this, so, looks better, but the important thing is the model got uh, more accurate, and it got more accurate from 93.5% to 94.1. So that's significant increase for not a lot of images uh, that I changed in the training set. Um, the intuition here is that maybe the model was at the end of the training kind of fighting to get more images right, but also getting the mistakes in the ground truth right. So it's kind of contradicting itself while it's doing that. Um, so labeling images manually can seem like a horrible task, and I don't know, but I thought it's like no problem, but doing it over 700 images can be like, okay, how, how am I gonna do it? Like, am I gonna like open and write down in a spreadsheet? That takes forever, so it's a good opportunity to make like a fun Python script to do that. I, at, at first I, I, I thought like, okay, I'll do like a small web page that goes through the images. But then I'm like, what am I doing? This will take me like too much. So very simple script, just takes the images, opens them so I see the image. 
I close it and then I hit on my keyboard like N, R, or G, enter, and it cycles for the images and just saves it in a dict and I use it afterwards, okay? Um, okay, the last trick I used to improve my model was uh, an ensemble of models, which is basically means I'm taking several models that I trained a little differently and I average their re results and the intuition that they will generalize better together. So one model was uh, like I told you that I did, another model was without the rotations, uh, and one more model, which is actually the more interesting one, is a model that I trained from scratch and not from pre-trained weights. Uh, so that model got a lower accuracy than the rest. It only got to 92.9. Um, but the intuition here is that it, maybe it learned different things about the, the data set. When I added all the three models, uh, that's how I got to the 94.9. 83% on my validation data, and on the challenge test set, I got to 94.955. Um, did you need the average? I did a weighted average. I tested a few values and got what worked the best on my validation set. Any questions about this before I talk a little bit about things that I did that didn't work? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, soon, soon, soon. Let me finish first. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll go through the interesting things I tried that didn't work, and I'll let you a couple minutes to ask about those what interests you more. So, I tried really hard to deal with the overfitting by changing like dropout, augmentation of the data with skews and shifts and things like that. Um, that didn't work. The data set was not entirely balanced, so I tried to like oversample from the less frequent classes that didn't work. I tried to separate my data set to day and night sets because it just seemed like it's very different uh, tasks. It's, it's a different task to recognize a traffic light at nighttime and at daytime, so I kind of separate them by the average pixel value. I'm kind of running through this, but just because we don't have time, the bottom line is it didn't work, okay? So you can't outsmart these networks sometimes. I tried to do localization, which basically means to figure out where the traffic light is in the image, crop a patch there, and then classify it. For that, I manually labeled the position of a bunch of the images, like 2,000. It didn't work. My assumption is it's not enough data to train something like that. Um, that's it for the time we have, and I'll take a few more questions. One, the prize was $5,000. One more, and that's it. The results of the runner-up was that, um, I think in terms of the some runner-ups got also used SqueezeNet, so they had a smaller model, but they got less accuracy. And others used bigger models, so they were penalized significantly more. But everyone were also less than 95% accuracy. Okay. Uh, thank you, and ask me questions after. <laughs>